Hello, everybody, and welcome to our program of temperature management. Uh, we'll be discussing the best practices to improve patient outcomes in the ED and ICU. Uh, my name is Michael Schwem. I'm the medical director of the emergency department here at Mercy Hospital in Coon Rapids, Minnesota, just on the north side of Minneapolis. This is a program that is provided by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, uh, an LLC and uh, HMP global company and is supported by an educational grant from 3M Healthcare Medical Solutions Division. Our objectives today, uh, we'll be discussing the different accuracies or lack thereof in core versus uh, peripheral temperature monitoring, including some of the different means to measure temperature in our patients, the advantages of continuous or remote temperature monitoring, and some COVID era adaptations that we have made to keep our staff safe. Obviously, we are all familiar uh, with key vital signs. These are core to the practice of emergency medicine and, and hospital-based medicine as well. Um, they're all essential. They're all prone to potential pitfalls. Some are measured more precisely than others. I believe we all trust the heart rate as measured by a cardiac monitor EKG. Palpating a pulse can read higher or lower depending on human error, poorly perfusing pre-excitation beats, hypotension, a variety of other factors. Uh, blood pressure cuffs are convenient, but not as accurate as art lines. We all know that, but it's not always feasible to place A lines in every patient in the ED that needs a blood pressure check. Uh, fingertip probes are convenient and painless to use for continuous oxygen saturation. Um, there are times when ABGs are necessary. And temperature historically has been checked by spot checks, barring invasive measures. Non-invasive monitoring is convenient, but many of the methods have had dubious accuracy. There is a lengthy differential diagnosis for any abnormal temperature, um, excluding simple monitoring error. Hyperthermia and hypothermia patients both uh, essentially start with sepsis. They're also obviously environmental exposures as well. And this is by no means an exhaustive list and the differential and the eventual diagnosis depend heavily on the context. So a hyperdynamic agitated patient with an elevated core temperature may be in a thyroid storm or have a sympathomimetic drug intoxication or reaction like neuroleptic malignant syndrome, uh, cocaine methamphetamine ingestion versus an abtunded patient may be suffering from a subarachnoid or heat stroke. Um, environmental exposures depend obviously on the time of year and context as well. For toxicology, the causes tend to be very different. Obviously, sympathomimetics versus a hypothermic patient may have alcohol, carbon monoxide, or some other type of sedative on board. Endocrine disorders, either thyroid or uh, DKA, thromboembolic, hyperthermia can be secondary to pulmonary emboli, DVTs, uh, or even some strokes for neurologic causes. Likewise, hypothermia may be neurologic or chronic neurologic uh, disease or simply measurement error, either for hyper or hypothermia, more commonly hypo. And of course, any immune system or inflammatory disorder or oncology can cause elevated core temperatures as well. The, the error rate is really quite notable, especially depending on the method that the temperature has been checked at triage or where the patient is located. A well-appearing patient presenting to our triage desk uh, drinking a cold beverage that has an oral temperature measured is probably going to read low. It's going to need to be rechecked. The, our biggest concern is to not miss a data point that would undercover an illness that would benefit from early intervention, which is most commonly sepsis. If it's not on your differential, you won't look for it, won't treat it, and patients can potentially be harmed. Unfortunately, this is made worse by uh, some of the literature. The literature is consistently inconsistent, but what it does reveal is that most peripheral measurements are not going to be anywhere near as accurate as, as a core. There are advantages and limitations related to accuracy and precision, as well as practicality and feasibility. Anyone with ED experience is aware of the pitfalls, and generally speaking, axillary temperatures, the kind that uh, we used to check at home as a kid with the old mercury thermometer, are not generally used in hospital settings. They are woefully inaccurate, somewhere around 30 to 35 percent sensitive. Oral temperatures are used quite frequently secondary to ease. However, the accuracy is all over the place and also depends on the context of the patient. Not every patient is capable of putting the temperature probe into the necessary sublingual area, and therefore you might have a falsely reassuring temperature in someone who's actually febrile. Uh, they're quick and easy but have an unacceptably high miss rate if your differential includes infection. For a patient showing up with a laceration or sprained ankle, maybe that doesn't matter as much because your 
pretest probability of an aberrancy and the temperature is already low. Uh, temporal scanners, temporal area scanners are also highly variable. They're dependent on ambient air temperature, skin temperature, technique, as well as peripheral perfusion. Inaccuracy actually seems to worsen as temperature extremes are reached as well. Further confounding this, uh, the difference can be even greater in different age groups. Temporal scanners, uh, I know were used at, at some sites to clear people to return to work. Uh, infrared temporal scanners, that is, um, I think we all saw situations where we would scan ourselves before showing up for our shift and reveal that we had a core temperature of 93. We felt fine. Um, really begs the, uh, the question of why, why were we relying on such a device with such a high inaccuracy rate. Tympanic measurements are definitely more accurate. They rely on technique and a clear tympanic canal, something as simple as earwax buildup in an ear, drum or ear canal, uh, can block the measurement. Uh, we've all seen patients with very serpiginous auditory canals. That can be difficult to see TMs. We might be getting falsely reassuring temperatures on those, but they are a modest improvement over temporal scanners and oral temperature probes. And rectal temperature has been essentially the gold standard that everything has been compared to. So axillary is definitely the worst. Oral and temporal, depending on how they're used and depending on the context, are, are a step up. Tympanic is better still. Uh, rectal remains the gold standard, and then core temperature as above and beyond everything else, however, is invasive, time-consuming as well. When it comes to rectal temperatures in the ED, they are close to a true core. I think we would argue that they're minimally invasive. However, we're not the ones often getting the temperature measured on us. Um, it is highly accurate and agrees with other invasive temperature measurements, but it's not always practical to do it in every patient every time. It's easy in infants and neonates and is considered best practice by the time you get into adolescent, teens, young adults, or patients with traumatic injuries, higher BMIs, anyone with a mobilization or anyone that needs multiple people to help roll or position a patient to get this one data point, it can be more challenging. And in some circumstances, it can be an awful lot of work to get one data point. Um, I also need to point out that if one already has a documented fever of 102 measured orally and you suspect sepsis, there's probably little benefit in repeating the temperature over and over again just to see how much higher it can be. Uh, if you've got your data point, it's probably worthwhile to go on with your other diagnostic tools and start treatment. Patient privacy is a big one for this. Many of our patients in our ED will start in an um, intake area, intake bay, that doesn't have as much privacy, primarily glass doors. They do have a curtain that can be pulled, but they also are in essentially cardiac chairs, so it's not always optimal to get a rectal temperature in someone that's sitting upright in a chair. There's also patient experience or refusal. Some people will simply say, absolutely not. And then body habitus, as already mentioned, can be very difficult. It can take several individuals donning and doffing PPE to go into a room and position a patient to get a rectal temperature. Uh, this next slide shows a um, what I presume to be a, an older uh, drawing of an individual here. It ranks the accuracy of all of the different temperature monitoring devices. It's a little eerie, but it gets the point across. Um, missing on this were the infrared forehead scanners, which I think we would all agree would get uh, three minuses. But rectum esophageal obviously is not a peripheral temperature monitoring method. Uh, axillary quite low, oral cavity a little bit above that. Tympanic is uh, certainly better, but not quite to the level of a rectal temperature. All these represent spot checks in the average ED. This generally means a nurse, a tech, a nursing assistant will, uh, at least in the COVID era, don PPE, go into the room, measure the temperature, doff the PPE, and manually enter it into the EMR. So the next few slides show some core monitoring methods, all of which are great, but by definition are invasive. And so one that is uh, more commonly used in the ICU or perhaps the operating room, less commonly used in the emergency department would be the central line pulmonary artery catheters. Uh, obviously uh, an upper body central line has to be placed for these. Um, there's procedural risk, including the risk of a central line associated bloodstream infection. They are invasive. If you are placing a line anyway and happen to have this available, it makes sense to go ahead and put this in. We do not stock these in our ED, maybe yours does. They are impractical to use for routine ED use. So as far as the initial screening, not so useful ongoing management, perhaps. 
And, and then of course, the standard procedural risks of arterial puncture and pneumothorax, et cetera, depending on your approach. We try to keep central lines in for as short a period as possible. There is cost associated with these as well. Uh, esophageal probes, uh, very useful, quite accurate, really requires intubation first and the ideal placement at T8, T9, then the ED is going to be a best guess. We simply want it buried to the point where we think it's going to be retrocardiac. Again, if we have a hypothermic or profoundly hyperthermic patient who is intubated, slipping in an esophageal probe at the same time as the NG tube or OG tube, may be realistic. They can become dislodged. They are quite accurate. Um, they do allow for ongoing monitoring, which is valuable. But again, for the majority of the you know, 98 to 99% of people who are not on a ventilator in our ED, it is not exactly practical for routine ED use. Bladder temperature probes with a thermistor in the tip. I think a lot of Hospitals do have this available. This may not be quite as accurate as esophageal or pulmonary artery. It does require a Foley to be placed, obviously. I believe a lot of hospitals have had strategies enacted to reduce the amount of catheters that get placed and to reduce the amount of time catheters spend in a bladder of patients because of the risk of a cauti. These are a couple hundred dollars each. If you need a Foley for I's and O's, if a patient is in ambulatory, if you need to do that minute to minute or hour to hour temperature monitoring in a patient, this may be reasonable. It could be considered. However, again, as we try to not place Foley's in quite as many patients to reduce the cauti risk, um, it may be not exactly practical for your patient. And again, for screening for sepsis purposes in the emergency department also, this does not appear to be a solution. There is a, sort of a best of both worlds that is available. A zero heat flux temperature monitor is available. These are primarily used in operating room settings right now as they are newer. They are non-invasive devices. They are lightweight, disposable with a reusable cord. So if you see the picture at the bottom, the foam pad, uh, the round white circle, is about the size of a 50 cent piece, perhaps a little bit smaller, clips into a reusable wipeable cord. I will uh, attempt to talk about the science of this just a little bit and apologies to the biomedical engineers out there who are, would handle this much better than I would, but they use a isothermic heat probe that goes through the tip of this, uh, which increases gradually with time. The core science behind this is the temperature from the core deep inside the tissues would rise to the surface until the point where there's no flux, there's no flow of heat from the deeper tissues going up through the probe, uh, at which point in time you have declared your temperature of the patient. Uh, these have actually been around since the early 70s, but the devices have improved and become more accessible and much smaller since then. They don't hurt. They don't require any uh, excessive amount of privacy or full disrobing of the patient. They do need to be pressed firmly, optimally to the forehead, uh, just off to the side or right around the temple of the patient to ensure a good seal. Any air bubbles or gaps in the seal would create potentially an erroneous read. Obviously, this can be applied at the same time as other monitors. The blood pressure cuff uh, doesn't require undressing, as I already said, doesn't require repositioning. It can be done by one nurse, one tech, or uh, even one clinician in the room. And it can be done in situations with very limited privacy. And unlike the chest leads that we place, they don't take a pinch of hair when removed. Um, they are quite sticky, but easy to remove. They correlate well with bladder and nasopharyngeal probes in operating room settings. The white patch at the tip of this is foam, very well insulated. It simply can be discarded after the use of a patient. It does take a little while to equilibrate. So the temperature that is flexing up through the skin and the soft tissues here, that's not an immediate read. There are thermodynamics involved. It takes a little while for that deeper temperature to make its way up to the surface, hit a zero flux state, but it does allow for continuous monitoring. And these are able to mesh well with whatever monitors you may have in the ED or ICU. It can be transmitted remotely to a panel of uh, screens or however you do your remote monitoring as well. So you can follow a patient's temperature, not necessarily at the bedside, uh, which can be very useful. Now on to the next slide here, perfect is the enemy of good. Thanks to Voltaire for repackaging this aphorism from other philosophers, but 
the goal uh, in the ED at least is not to have a perfect measurement of the temperature uh, down to the tenth of a degree. There's no method that's going to give us that answer. And some of the most accurate means to collect these data points may be overly invasive, overly costly, just frankly impractical. However, timing counts. So the faster we can get an answer as to the core temperature of a patient, we can reduce delays. And as we know from the sepsis data, even a delay in 15 minutes in a patient with cryptic sepsis or shock can have a material impact on the morbidity, mortality, and hospital length of stay of a patient. Also, there's a material impact in flow of your emergency department. So delays in identifying sepsis can make a patient that normally would have uh, been admitted in four hours now is staying in your ED for six or seven. And accuracy is good. Uh, it'll never be perfect, but speed and ease of use definitely count. None of these methods I discussed above are necessarily going to completely displace any of the other ones. There's always going to be a place for oral temperature monitoring. There may be a place in your ED or ICU for tympanic temperature monitoring. But I do think they all have their place within most busy EDs. As with any other part of a vital sign picture, they're part of the diagnostic puzzle. And just like any other vital, it's going to potentially change during a patient's assessment. The diagnosis for someone with a COVID exposure, cough, and the oral temperature of 102 at triage may be fairly straightforward. I think like a lot of you, I'm more concerned about the person who perhaps uh, fell off the toilet seat at 2 a.m. or was too weak to get up and get out of bed or presents with delirium or altered mentation and may have that initial temperature that's normal. I'm sure we've all seen these come as bounce backs when the previous ED visit measured a temperature of, you know, normal or 99.1 and then came back the next day or two days later, now profoundly ill. This makes a big difference, both for the morbidity, mortality of the patient uh, outcomes data and for safety, obviously within the ED and making sure we get our timing of antibiotics done appropriately. The erroneously normal temperature, or maybe it was a normal temperature at the time, could just be natural progression of disease, a false negative, normal first measurement, or perhaps the patient took antipyretics at home that have since worn off and now the fever is declaring itself. Whether it's 100.5 or 105, that temperature at triage is going to probably take me down the same path. We just need to know it's there. Uh, I don't need to necessarily know that it's 100.5 uh, versus 100.8. They're both elevated in my mind. So it's important to realize the weaknesses, but also not get too caught up in the weeds of the absolute precision down to the tenth of a degree. And this next slide is the primary driver of a lot of our desire for uh, earlier recognition of a fever. I'm not going to talk as much about the environmental causes of temperature aberrations. If someone is a runner in mid-August uh, without water and comes into your ED without sweating hot and confused, that's not as much of a diagnostic dilemma. We all know what that is. Neither is the person who is found outside in the snow, underdressed, bradycardic, minimally responsive. We, we know what that's gonna be as well. Both situations need to be treated quickly and actively. It's more important to know the range of the temperature than the precise number down to the tenth of a degree. However, early recognition of sepsis is probably the most obvious reason that we care about this. We obviously have hundreds of reasons to care about appropriate temperature management and identification. This is probably the one that's most impactful for the ED and ICU. Uh, completing SEP measures, the CMS core measures that are mandated and considered best practice, are uh, essential. They're reportable and early recognition is key. They're essential because we know that the more tightly you adhere to those SEP measures, the better outcomes your patients will have. Uh, early identification of fever is extremely helpful and guiding us down to the sepsis pathway. Delays in diagnosis cause longer hospital stays, worse outcomes, increased morbidity and mortality, all of which we obviously don't want for our patients. This is even more challenging during the COVID era. Many hospitals, if not most, do not have family members present to help give history and to help weigh in on what's been going on at home. We might be in a, an information vacuum. We have visitor restrictions. And so that loved one, that son, daughter, granddaughter, spouse, brother, sister, that normally would be with a patient to help relay some of the symptoms that would normally tell us, yeah, we checked the temperature early this morning, the temperature was 102 at home. They may not be there. 
the history may be very difficult to obtain. And given the very vague overlap of symptoms with sepsis versus other symptoms, to get that little data point, that temperature early makes a huge difference. This next slide is actually quite concerning to me. Patients with an infection, uh, mortality is actually inversely related to higher temperatures in the ED. So your person that presents with a, with a temperature of 103 actually has a lower in-hospital mortality than the person that presents with a temperature of less than uh, 98.6. Now, that could be because of decompensation at the hypothalamic level. Uh, the patient that may have a difficult time mounting a fever might be physiologically more ill. However, it's concerning that the essentially euthermic patient population, those with a temperature at or below 37, had an in-hospital mortality of 36% in this series versus the markedly febrile patient uh, had a mortality of only 15.5%. I say only, really that's actually quite high. It's also concerning if you look on the far right that 231 of these patients were missing a temperature recorded altogether. Uh, and that patient population had a 31.6% mortality. Whether this is secondary to a screamingly febrile patient with a very high core temperature being much more evident did they get the antibiotics earlier? I suspect so. Whether, whether that impacted the outcomes or whether it was because of deep down physiologic changes remains to be seen. Uh, however, it is clear that elevated temperature led to much better outcomes, likely because of earlier recognition. So the earlier we can capture that elevated temperature, the better. On this next slide, um, this is a table that was published in an excellent review of septic shock patients in the ED in critical care medicine. This looked at patients in the emergency department and their presenting symptoms. And here's where things can get frightening. We've all seen these cases and have probably had them slide right under, right under our nose as well. Um, nothing feels worse than to have someone that presented with a fall. You do a series of x-rays, everything looks good. You're about ready to discharge them. And the follow-up vital sign check at the tail end of the ED stay reveals that they're febrile. We've all seen these cases. They all happen to us. And they happen with shocking regularity. The patient with the advanced age that falls out of bed, slides out of a chair, comes in with traumatic injuries, we should consider them septic until proven otherwise. This is a breakdown of vague versus typical sepsis symptoms. It's a very busy table. I'll break out some of the data in the next few slides. The demographics in the two groups were roughly identical. It's going to be very small here. You'll have to sort of trust me on this one because I don't know if you'll be able to see that. The biggest differences in the two groups and the outcomes were uh, one, the lack of fever in the patients presenting with more vague symptoms. Uh, actually, in this group, 0% presented with a fever at triage. I, I find that hard to believe it was literally zero. Um, their cutoff was 100.4 at, at or above 100.4. As far as the remaining symptoms go, there was perhaps a slightly greater chance that they had hypotension of less than 90, their GCS of less than 15, also slightly greater as well. Their heart rate was essentially identical, no significant differences there. The GCS, the Glasgow Coma Scale, being depressed is obviously an enormous red flag and is an independent predictor for mortality for any presenting emergency. In this hospital, when what they defined as their acute care area, my suspicion is equivalent to most other EDs, critical care stabilization rooms, which brings me to the third, triage to the acute care area. The clinicians knew in this situation that they were sick. And so if we interpret their acute care area as their higher acuity part of their ED, they knew they were sick right away. But it looks like there was a treatment and diagnosis dilemma um, depressed mentation and lack of fever are associated with lengthy differentials, a lot of hurdles that come across uh, finally getting to the appropriate diagnosis. I assume most our patients with a depressed GCS probably had advanced neuroimaging of the brain, which may delay things as well. If we go on to the next slide, this further supports that the absence of a documented fever but also the correlating symptoms of chills and rigors. So the body trying to generate a fever uh, was associated with an odds ratio of 2.7 for mortality, really high. The only thing that approached that and the other factors that were identified here was liver disease. So severe liver disease cirrhosis had an odds ratio of 4.83, again, quite high. And an advanced cancer diagnosis was roughly 2.5. 
So if you look at the absence of fever chills or rigors, as far as the odds ratio of a mortality, that had an odds ratio of 2.7, just really remarkable numbers here. Even vasopressor use for hypotension, shock, and the ED only had an odds ratio of 1.98. Uh, intubation, so to the point where someone was not able to either guard their airway because of depressed cementation, respiratory failure had an odds ratio of 2.09. So identification of a fever, if it's there, absolutely critical. Absence of a fever, as we know, doesn't get us out of the woods necessarily. And when you think about uh, how poor of a prognosis severe liver disease gives patients for anything or active cancer diagnoses gives patients for anything, this is even more remarkable. When patients arrive in the ED, what we know up front is quite small. Uh, when patients arrive in the ICU, depending on where they come from, there's likely some more data that's been collected, but may not be complete. Uh, what we don't know for the most part in the ED is much larger. So what we know is small. We know the triage history. We know a chief complaint. If we're lucky, we may have some information from family members. What we don't know is much larger, but what we fear is what we don't know, we don't know. For sepsis patients with worsening outcomes, that lack of identified temperature abnormality, is it a sign of early physiologic decompensation? Is it a sign of that we're just measuring at such a small slice in time and is the natural progression of their disease going to be that they eventually spike a fever hours later? Uh, was it a failure to check the temperature over time? Was it a failure to monitor the patient thoroughly over the time the patient spends in the ED? Were there stuttering fevers? Was there antipyretic medication taken at home prior to arrival? And that's why things look so good when we're seeing them. Uh, or was the, the temperature measured using an accurate method? Uh, what we don't know can hurt us, but what we don't know, we don't know is even more dangerous. So for ongoing temperature monitoring, we do have the ability to do spot checks. This is the most common technique. Uh, it is available in EDs. Temperature is not apt to change as quickly as heart rate, blood pressure, oxygen saturations. Uh, obviously, heart rate can change on a dime. Oxygen saturations can worsen, although usually not quite as quickly, except in cases of ARDS, blood pressure can tank quite quickly as well. Temperature, just because of the thermodynamics of heating up or cooling down the tissue that makes up our body, are probably not going to change all that quickly. However, it can happen. And if you're uh, ED is anything like mine is, and admissions tend to stick around for hours while we search for a bed. Uh, it's a continuous measurement that is helpful. Um, obviously, the most common technique is going to be the spot checks. With that, there is going to be entrance and egress from the room every time. During the COVID era, that is going to result in a staff making sure the appropriate eyewear is being worn, making sure that the appropriate level of gowning is on, foaming into a room, loving up, checking the temperature, uh, repositioning the patient, foaming out of the room, and taking off the protective gowns or any other type of PPE that they may be worn. We do not place indwelling rectal probes in patients. We generally don't place esophageal or Foley probes either. Really what we look for is something that's more practical, uh, less invasive, and easy to use. Any data point that we can detect even an hour or two into the ED that can shift our differential and our diagnostics as well as our treatment is valuable. Recurrent rectal temperatures can be used. They're not as practical or popular amongst patients. Most people will tolerate one, but not generally several if we need it. It can be done, especially in those with reduced mobility. Um, the number of hands needed in the room to get this can be a real drag on resources. So if you're pulling two or three individuals into a room to position a patient repeatedly to do rectal temperatures every couple of hours, that can really bog down the flow through the ED. Now, a little word on the COVID era. I would be remiss to talk about temperature management and monitoring in the current climate without discussing COVID-19. There obviously has not been an ED or ICU in the country that has been spared the impact of this pandemic. There also aren't any EDs or ICUs that are specifically built to manage a respiratory pandemic. I think that what we've experienced and seen so far has really exposed our vulnerabilities. It has been very humbling for most of us as well. The frontline staff that has rode this out, that has managed this with the patients, that has held the hand of those patients, have been impacted dramatically. 
we've done our best to reduce the amount of exposures uh, that our staff has, including reducing the time in the room of COVID-19 patients to reduce the possibility of getting sick. Going into this with the early data coming out of the hard hit areas in Italy, Spain, China, we're very concerned that we would not be able to safely protect our staff. I think as time has gone on, we've realized that with appropriate PPE, we can manage this quite safely. But the main goal of management throughout the pandemic has been to ensure that staff are safe, They're safe in their jobs, make sure they can show up and feel confident in their PPE and their work while at work. We closely monitor our very finite PPE supplies. Some of our PPE, including our gowns, are reusable. They're washable and they can be used thousands of times without breaking down. However, there's still costs attached to that. They have to be donned and then doffed safely, put into bins. Those bins get laundered. There's cost to that. They have to be folded up, put back into the ED. There's cost to that as well. Linen services needs to collect, launder, and restock the clean gowns there's opportunity and exposure costs to repeated entrance and egress from COVID positive rooms as well. There's costs if a staff has a high level of exposure, there's costs if a staff has to be put out of work because of quarantine. And if someone gets sick, it's even worse. There's cost to the morale of the department and that person could end up being critically sick, possibly even die. There have been thousands of frontline workers that have died so far during this pandemic. And so reducing the amount of exposures everyone gets is critical. We certainly have better testing than we did six months ago. I think we all know that. I hope you do at your hospital too. And by and large, we don't have a lot of information up front on many patients with COVID. All we know is that patient X presenting through triage or by ambulance has shortness of breath and feels weak. Not that they are a confirmed COVID positive patient. All the other diagnoses, and we know this too, continue alongside of COVID. They obviously have not stopped. So low bar pneumonia, bacterial pneumonias, heart failure, pyelonephritis, they, they haven't necessarily stopped. They eerily may have dipped in the spring and they sometimes dip down below where they probably should be when there's certain types of shutdowns that occur. However, they still happen and we still have to make those diagnoses correct in the pandemic era. The COPD exacerbations, the CHF exacerbations, they still occur. The main difference is that pilo patient, that patient with pneumonia, that patient with COPD or heart failure is not going to take down staff. You're not going to take that home with you. That is not going to make me sick. The data surrounding fever as a presenting symptom in COVID-19 uh, has evolved as we've become more familiar with the illness, but overall, and I'm sure we are seeing this all in our EDs, slightly less than half of patients presenting to the ED with COVID have a temperature elevation as a presenting symptom at the time of their emergency department evaluation. The number is even lower for children. And that makes sense, right? That makes sense because we know that there's not as many ill kids with COVID. They certainly are out there and we've certainly seen them. By and large, they tend to be impacted less severely than adults. But even in adults, it's been somewhere slightly less than 50% have an active identifiable fever at the time of presentation. If you uh, look at this graph, which was published in early June, I believe this graph was published at the tail end of the first wave. That first wave is just receding, and this is from the CDC's uh, MMWR. This lists the percentage of hospitalized healthcare workers sick with COVID from March through May of 2020. Those that were hit most severely were the ones that were doing most of the bedside care for patients. The CNAs, the nursing assistants, nursing aides, patient care aides, PCAs, phlebotomists who have to be sitting at the bedside with the patient's arm out trying to get blood, housekeeping staff or maintenance staff, nursing home staff. Physicians were quite far down in the list because I believe we don't spend as much time at the bedside as all these other professionals do. All these other healthcare workers spend more time at the bedside and therefore are more likely to get sick. So 36% were nursing aides, nursing assistants, CNAs. Impacts those workers, those essential key frontline workers very substantially. So the more that we can reduce the amount of exposures, reduce the amount of entrance and egress from a room, do continuous temperature monitoring rather than you know, a spot check every three hours, perhaps the better. If we look at this graph from the Lancet on 
the next slide here. This is the percentage of seropositive workers amongst Danish healthcare workers, so uh, not in the United States. And bear in mind, our rate of illness in the United States has been vastly higher over this period of time. This data came out in late August. So we had seen very uh, rough pandemic spikes in certain parts of the countries, but not all. Sure, the numbers would look a lot worse in the United States right now. But if you look at the healthcare workers in COVID-19 wards, with seropositive blood work, you'll see that healthcare workers on COVID-19 wards were quite high. Frontline healthcare workers were less severely impacted. General healthcare workers, maybe not dealing with COVID-19, were lower. And then uh, blood donors were monitored just as a, a barometer for what was all in the community. Little did we know where we would be now. I'd be curious to see what this number would look like if replicated in some of the hot spots throughout the Midwest, and obviously the hotspots are going to move around with time. But my suspicion is this would look much worse for those of us uh, right now. If you look at the next slide, uh, same article, also not in the United States. The data did cut off in August, but as you can see, the zero positive patients uh, also in Denmark also would probably underestimate our numbers we're seeing in the United States, but remains to be seen, shows that the most impacted clinicians and healthcare workers were involved in respiratory medicine. Again, not a surprise. They're managing the uh, sputum, head of the bed, respiratory secretions of patients that are probably the sickest. Uh, the less sick COVID patients are probably not being seen by anyone in pulmonology or respiratory medicine. Emergency medicine was up there as well as infectious diseases and ENT. And interestingly, hematology was quite high up there as well. I'm not clear exactly why that is. Uh, intensive care was a little bit further down the list, although still in the top third. And then unsurprisingly at the bottom were those that maybe are less apt to be exposed to people with active COVID-19, gastroenterology, dermatology, neurosurgery, et cetera. So again, Reducing the amount of exposures we have to the patient, very important in making sure everyone stays safe. And a little uh, parting word on, on COVID-19. We know this has been crushing for our healthcare system and our staff. We have finite staff. There is no backup. We have finite PPE. There's more coming, but all of us have probably reworn those masks, reworn the gowns, sat all day in PPE, very uncomfortably so. I don't think any of us realized that this would be how 2020 would end up. I can't wait to see how much better this is going to look with the vaccine in play. Given that anyone with or without a fever or with or without respiratory symptoms or with or without any of the following, including chest pain, confusion, weakness, myalgias, hypoxia or any abnormalities in their breathing, GI tract symptoms, all the way down to sore throat, loss of taste or smell may have COVID. Given that our frontline staff is at highest risk while at the bedside, while in closed rooms that probably don't have negative pressure, they probably don't have adequate amount of ventilation, it's prudent to try to limit the less critical entrance and egress in and out of the rooms, which also in turn limits the donning and doffing of PPE. And in theory, the numbers of opportunities staff have to get exposed and taken down by COVID. Anything we can do to continuously, preferably remotely, monitor necessary vitals, including temperature, to get a clear clinical picture in the COVID era, a better set of vitals for our patients who are sick before us would reduce the need for staff to go in and out of rooms, uh, hopefully reduce the amount of exposures we get and keep everyone safe and healthy. Like I said before, there's no backup with this. If the ED, ICU, COVID cohort units, uh, urgent cares, frontline staff gets taken out, um, there's not a second line of individuals who are going to come in and, and take our spot. Um, we have seen massive amounts of our staff get wiped out with COVID so far, uh, some more sick than others, but we've got to try to keep everyone healthy uh, until we can get that vaccine in. Before we close, I wanted to talk just a bit about some commonly asked questions that we have that I've fielded from some of my colleagues who might be directors at other sites, one of which is how applicable is this going to be in my ED? I guess my department is somewhat crowded 
We see about 67 to 68,000 patients per year. We have a relatively high acuity, roughly a 29 to 30% admission rate and a high level of critical care. We do see trauma patients. We're a cardiac center, stroke receiving center as well. So if your ED sees considerable high acuity volume, i say this is essential, it's critical. Um, I would also say if your ED has a significant lag in getting people out of the lobby and into a room, measuring that temperature up front can be the difference between assigning an ESI 2 and perhaps an ESI 3 or 4. So that patient may jump line uh, if you know they are febrile. Also, we have a fairly limited amount of multi-purpose beds. Uh, they are quite often full. And a lot of our medical care is done in rapid assessment bays, which are less private. And so uh, ensuring an appropriate and accurate temperature read with the most accurate device we can get our hands on, allowing for the lack of privacy in those areas is useful for us as well. So it really depends on, on what type of setup you have. If you've got you know tons of rooms, uh, there's never any delays in getting people into rooms um, all the time in the world. Maybe you don't need as many options at your disposal as we have requested and as we use. My suspicion is if you're listening to this presentation, you don't have those luxuries. And the other question I receive is what do we use at triage? We do not use tympanic or temporal screens. We use a standard oral lingual uh, temperature monitoring device at triage for adults and for children and infants. We use rectal temperatures. That is generally well tolerated by the infants and neonates. Obviously, they're not going to fight back too much. Uh, not a real option to do that for adults. If there is an error or if we think a number is just simply too good to be true, we do have the ability to use a zero flux temperature monitor on the forehead to give us some better information. And we can do that from triage or in our rapid assessment area as well. And another question we get here is what temperature monitoring devices are you actively using? We do have the ability to place esophageal probes Obviously, in Minnesota, we see a fair amount of temperature extremes, although not as many as one would think. We do see some people who are very cold, although more often than not, they're not outside exposed environmentally. They're in their own home, septic. We do see people that are very, very hot, particularly individuals who might be working outside in the middle of August all day without enough water, or we maybe need to do some more continuous temperature monitoring. We can place esophageal probes. We don't often do that. We use oral temperatures, uh, or rectal temperatures using a different probe, same device, different probe, obviously. And we also use uh, zero flux forehead temperature monitors. We can place bladder temperature monitors, although we do not do that in the ED. And we do not place uh, pulmonary artery catheters, place central lines, but not temperature monitoring central lines in our department. We find that there's place for all of them. No one device is going to be foolproof. You have to decide for yourself what's going to be most applicable in your ED, depending on the resources you have. To a certain extent, if one device is not giving us the number we're looking for, we continue to march up the chain of perhaps invasiveness until we get the numbers we're looking for or until we've ruled out the condition. But those are the devices we're using actively right now. With that, I will end my discussion. Thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate your listening. Thank you.